Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel, as well as other stuff. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week and live stream on the weekend. Before I even begin, let me first say that yes, I know I have included a lot of lichen artwork in this video. The pics are pretty much cl a close fit for the creature we're talking about today, so I've taken some license there. The Quaggoth first appeared in first edition of the original Fiend Folio published in 1981. So I would say that they featured in the pages of White Dwarf magazine in the UK, though I don't have that particular issue. They predate the original Grey Box Forgotten Realm set, but feature in the Monsters of Faerun book published later. They have had some shifts in their specific lore, but the basics of the Quaggoth have remained the same. So I can provide you with some more in-depth lore on them, to fill in the blanks a bit. So settle back, grab yourself a beverage, let's get deeply nerdy. In the era known as the Days of Thunder, we know about the reptilian, amphibian and avian creator races in more detail than we know about the humans and the fey immortals called the Lachey. We know the Lachey were around on the world of Toril in that timeline before any of the original green elves arrived from the fey realms, incarnating on the mortal world in a form very similar to the Lachey, but mortal. We know that humans, dwarves and other ancient races of humanoids lived on the fringes of the ever-expanding empire of the reptilian Saruk some 40,000 years or more before the present day in the Dale Reckoning. Between the end of the Blue Age and the Age of Thunder, there was another dominant civilization on the supercontinent that was inexorably displaced and driven into colder climates, inhospitable terrain, and into caves and caverns in the mountains. And remember, this was before any such thing as an orc on the world of Toril, it would be many thousands of years before they or the giants arrived, and if there were any dragons around at this time, it was the occasional Ur dragon, a, more like a big reptile than a real draconic being. So the wild northern reaches and the far east of Faerun were very different places, inhabited by tremendously large mammals, huge flightless birds, giant insects, and the creatures that would one day be bred into the Remoras. The, the rock, the bear, and other creatures shaped by the giants into weapons to be directed at the dragons in their thousand year genocidal war. In this primitive landscape of tooth and claw, the most successful humanoid species were large, animalistic, hairy, and savage quaggoth, a race of strong and predatory tribal people who hunted the megafauna of the time. What modest intellect they had was all the advantage they needed, as humans were also in a very primitive state and only existed in small numbers in specific locations. The dwarves were far to the east and largely unconcerned with the surface world, and the reptilians were still confined to the lush warmth of the central lands and the shores of the inner seas and lakes. But times changed, and the Quaggoth were not able to compete with the incursions of the more intelligent invaders, so they moved on, as they always had migrating and following the beasts they hunted into ever colder and more inaccessible places, learning to despise the elves who arrived and seemed to just delight in hunting them down and killing them with just as much as the Quaggoth hunted and killed and ate them in return. Eventually, great empires rose and fell. The surface world was dramatically changed with the elves sundering the continent. The giants and the dragons dominated the air and the land, then fell into decline along with the elves, and the orcs grew to infest the former homelands of the Quaggoth, but they had long since vanished into the darkness below. The last who survived had ventured deeper and deeper, hunting cave bears and foraging for mushrooms, venturing out to raid and kill the hated elves on the surface, taking them down below to feed their tribe. But what food was increasingly hard to find. The hunters returned from the surface with no meat for the tribe. In desperation and anger, the tribe then turned on the weakest of their own people and fed on them instead. What were once sacred rituals where the dead were consumed to keep their spirit alive in the living flesh of their own people became a regular practice of cannibalism and a slow descent into increasingly savage ways. While the hunting was better, the deeper into the underdark they went, the dangers were greater as well. They encountered intelligent species even older than their own kind and vastly more intelligent, who captured the Quaggoth and bred them as slaves, dividing the population into those who were wild and those who were the property of the aberrations. Much later, the Dark Elves were changed by the Elven Gods and fled below into the deep caverns 
the Quaggoth had long ago inhabited in greater numbers. The drow were right at home in these blood-soaked caverns and built profane altars to their demon goddess on the former butchering blocks the Quaggoth had used to ritualistically consume the dead and slaughter their weak. The drow were quick to dominate the few wild Quaggoth they encountered, killing most but keeping a few, as they discovered the Quaggoth were immune to the poisonous venom of the giant spiders who flocked to the call of Loth, the spider goddess. Quaggoth had long ago perfected the art of hunting giant insects in the Underdark and fashioned heavy hammers of stone fastened securely to thick thigh bone shafts, which were very effective at crushing the carapace of giant beetles and spiders. A giant spider roasted over a fire, steamed in ge- geothermal vents, or boiled in bubbling mud pools makes for a tasty meal, more than enough to feed a small band of Quaggoth. They hunt cave fishes and drink a potent grog made from the creature's alcoholic blood. Plus, they have a great fondness they developed over many generations of being rewarded by the Dark Elves with roasted succulent rothe meat. As well as a regular supply of goblins, they spit roast and eat, much like humans of the surface world would gut, stuff, skewer and cook a chicken. Quaggoths use goblin bones and skulls for decorations, utensils, bowls and fire pots, which terrifies the goblins and keeps them in control, as they know that... To escape the drow would mean certain death because the drow would send the quaggoths after them who would be more than happy to go on a raid and hunt down and kill these uh, other smaller humanoids. The quaggoths in turn act as a brute labour, pulling carts, hauling loads with ropes and pulleys and herding spiders. Particularly the more dangerous, highly venomous spiders the drow rely on so heavily for coating their hand crossbow darts and fortified toxins of various kinds. Giant spiders are not intelligent creatures, neither are they resentful or vindictive, so you either know how to handle them or your spider food. Quaggoths are better at handling spiders without any need of magic than most drow. They can also fend for themselves pretty well in the Underdark and form outlying tribal communities who have a small degree of autonomy while st- have a small degree of autonomy while still being at the beck and call of the merciless dark elves. One thing cements this relationship above all else, however, and that is the shared racial enmity of the surface elves, as the drow call them the fairy elves of the world above. Quaggoth are, they're still migratory, even in the Underdark, and they have a strong independent streak, but they tend to migrate around drow society. In the Monster Manual for 5th edition, we see the option of including the psionic versions of the Quaggoth called the Thonaut. The, quas, uh, the psychic powers listed there are exactly as they had in previous editions, so I'm happy to say this is a faithful reproduction, true to the pre-existing law. Uh, and that is, uh, let's see, I'll just pull it up here. They have, at will, they can use Featherfall and Mage Hand, and the Mage Hand is invisible as it's representing telekinetic force. Once each day, they can cast Cure Wounds, Enlarge, Reduce, Heat Metal, and Mirror Image. So heat metal is particularly effective. Like most humanoid predators of the Underdark, uh, the Quaggoths are adapted to breed to the conditions. Oh, sorry, the uh, I should talk more about the Thonauts. The random occurrence of Thonauts in the population is strikingly similar to the way goblins occasionally manifest what is known as a blue, because they actually are blue, as it so happens. But they also have uh, psychic powers. Humans also manifest psychic powers even more than the elves and the dwarves do, though they don't look much different from any other member of their species. The Thonauts don't look very different from the other Quoggoths as well, apart from an increased propensity for shaving their hair off and wearing crystals for some reason. Well, that's what the humans do. The Thonauts don't do that. Thonauts may well be the emergent genes of escaped captives reintegrated into the population from those who have been bred and used by the heavily psychic aberration species, the Aboleth and the Mind Flayers, who make heavy use of Quaggoths for thousands of years. The Drow make use of this resource when discovered, but it is the fate of the Thonauts to serve their tribe as a shaman, whether they like it or not. They just happen to have a better memory for things, but they don't have a higher intelligence, so I'll talk about that in a minute. So, the Quaggoths are adapted to breed to, to, to the conditions of the Underdark. They gestate their offspring almost a month longer than a human, and the infants are born with a downy coat of fluffy platinum blonde fur. They're able to crawl around much earlier than a human infant and mature faster than an orc does. Uh, by, but still, uh, your average adventurer, a Quaggoth, an adult, is about 14 years of age. They have a similar lifespan to a, uh, to a, a human or an orc, so a drow will see many generations of Quaggoth born and dying. Of course, they usually die a violent death. Quaggoth have 
they almost got a lack of culture. Their intelligence really has regressed a lot. Even the Thonauts are no more intelligent than others in their tribes. The intelligence of six means they have difficulty with any sort of complex task. And just the act of fashioning a primitive stone-tipped club is as mystical and amazing to them as fashioning a magical weapon is to the more intelligent races. They are an aggressive and grumpy species that reacts with violence to things that they don't understand and they don't want to understand. They are said to be willfully resistant to learning anything, particularly how to use tools. The fact that they can speak under common at all is thanks to having it drummed into them by the drow, along with free meals of goblin and rother meat. Cogath may be stupid, but they are clever enough not to bite the hand that feeds them, and if they get extra meat just by learning how to grunt a few more words, they can spare the time to for that painfully cerebral activity. While often depicted as using clubs and hammers, 5th edition is more accurate in that Quaggoth fight with their claws. They have a wisdom of 12, which should actually be a bit higher considering their superb senses, with their hearing and smell being about the same as that of a bear. They can see 120 feet in darkness, but unlike the drow, the driders and the dwagar, they have no sensitivity to sunlight, and in some remote parts of the world, they still do live closer to the surface world and regularly hunt large animals and weaker humanoids returning below the ground to share the kills with the tribe. Where once they were humanoids uh, who kept their where once they, they were humanoids who kept their covering of a tawny brown fur, now they lose all fur on their limbs and chest, just keeping a sort of a uh, mane of grey or white fur on their shoulders and back, with tufts of it on the back and sides of their head. Their face has always been a somewhat bear-like appearance, well adapted to their role as a predator. They have a strength of 17, dexterity of 12, and a constitution of 16, so they are more than a match for even a very fit and skilled human fighter. They have a thick hide, particularly on their lower limbs and their back, which gives them a natural armor class of 13. They are capable of wearing additional armor, but they just simply refuse to do so. They have 68 plus 18, or between 24 and 66, with an average of 45 hit points. They are very strong and can often leap into combat with a plus 5 on their athletics checks and are excellent climbers, as you would expect from an underdark species, with a movement and climbing speed of 30 feet per round. They're no good at burrowing, or even mining though, since they don't sh- blunt their uh, sharp claws by scratching at rocks and dirt, and they can't really figure out how to pick, build a pickaxe. They'd be terrible at playing Minecraft, but superb at smashing up electronic devices. They are fearless fighters, and rarely back down from a confrontation, attacking with two rapid claw attacks each round. They are plus 5 to hit and inflict 1d6 plus 3 slashing damage per swipe. They are not clever hunters who would wound a leg to slow down prey. They just leap in and tear a target to shreds until it stops moving. Then they will pause, rip open its guts to grab a tasty liver to replenish its strength. Uh, replenish its strength for the efforts of carrying the corpse back to the tribe. One interesting feature that really highlights how ferocious they are in combat is the feature called Wounded Fury, in which a quaggoth reduced to 10 hit points or less has advantage on all attack rolls. In addition, it deals an extra 2d6 damage to any target it hits with a melee attack, any melee attack, claws or club or whatever. This is a significant ramping up of deadliness. The average, uh, the advantage on attack rolls, with no disadvantage on its own defences, means it has a much better chance of dishing out a critical hit. It's already got a good chance of hitting an adventure anyway. This is 5th edition after all. It is a challenge rating 2 creature, but Quaggoth attack in groups. They are not a challenge rating 2 encounter more like a 5 or above. Otherwise, chances are as soon as the player character lands a hit or two on the Quaggoth, it's just going to hulk out on them, and the player is going to end up left with a torn up character sheet. Does anyone still use paper character sheets? Hmm. I just noticed that the passive perception of the Quaggoth is 11 in the printed monster manual and 10 in the D&D Beyond's listing. I wonder why. Is that the same with your uh, your printed copy of Monster Manual? You can find a Quaggoth Den encounter in the Out of the Abyss campaign sourcebook. In it, we learn a couple more facets of Quaggoth culture. The first is that they share a common eating and sleeping area, that each of them makes a nest-like mound of debris and scattered bones of the Quaggoth's last meal, or previous past meals. They do not know how to cure the hides of their prey or to make leather or furs. They share their meals in this common area, which means they typically eat quite a lot in one sitting and then sleep off the meal, with the less dominant quaggoth staying awake and in and around the den, ostensibly keeping watch. This means that a short while after they have taken a kill back to their den is the best time to attack them, but 
but going in there against an average tribe of 12 adults is not a good idea. I suggest a liberal use of alchemical fire or some well-placed fireballs. Burning a large amount of the oxygen out of the air before collapsing the entrances and exits to a den of creatures which don't burrow for a living will quickly snuff out the tribe from existence. The encounter also states that Quaggoth don't attack other Quaggoth they don't know on site. They also don't attack drow without good reason. It also states that they may have spiders in the den with them. That they don't attack, they just cohabitate with them. Basically, the Quaggoth don't mind being spider shepherds, and the den also serves as a spider pen or barn. Of course, it's more likely that these are going to be highly venomous spiders, and you'd be missing an opportunity if you didn't fill their, their dens with the most venomous spiders you can find. They will growl questions at any strange quaggoth or growl that enters their den though, and any other creature that walks in there will be treated like an unexpected free pizza delivery. Please hit the like button if you made it this far and you enjoyed what I do. Subscribe if you like it and check out my Patreon for some exclusive content for all the scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, check out Patreon Blades for your mighty smooth shave. And as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.